Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, good morning, church. We're going to get this started one way or another, right? Let's give this worship team a hand, though. They did awesome this morning. I really enjoyed this worship. I love the songs that we sing this morning. It's really easy to get into it and to be able to hear ourselves sing over worship. And I love that in church. I don't know about you, but I do. So if you are with us this morning for the first time, welcome. If you are watching online for the first time this morning, thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you've missed any of the of the services, you can uh, feel free to tune in on either our website, fbcmawikwa.org, or our um, YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe to that. Uh, we are in our uh, sermon series, Sermon on the Mount, a kingdom upside down. This is our second week, and we're going to jump right in with a story this morning. Uh, there was a young lady that was grocery shopping, and she was out loading her groceries into the car. And she saw or noticed an elderly gentleman that was trying to load his groceries into the car. And he was kind of struggling a little bit. And so she said, sir, is there any way that, can I help you? Can I help you get your groceries into the car? And he said, that would be great. And so she stopped what she was doing and helped him get all of his groceries into the car. And he said, can I help you into your vehicle as well? And he said, thank you so much. And and he said, that is the nicest thing anyone has done for me in in so long, but I have to tell you something. I happen to be the richest man in the world. She's like, no. No, seriously, I am, and I don't have anybody to give my wealth to. So I would like to will it all to you. She's like, seriously? No, seriously. And she goes, no, no. He said, name what you want, and I will give it to you. So she thought about it for a minute. Boy, anything? Anything. She said, well, if you're the richest man in the world, then I would like you to end world hunger. He's like, listen, I said I was the richest man in the world, but that's a tall order. I don't know if I could really afford that. So can you think of anything else that you would want? So she thought about it, and she thought about it for a minute. She goes, you know what? I've always wanted a husband. (laughs) And so he's like, all right, that's kind of a strange request, but, but continue. And she goes, no, seriously, if you're the richest man in the world, maybe you can help me with this. And so here's what I want. She, so she started listing what she wanted. I would like a man that, that, that would be a, a, a great with kids, that wants children, that's a, that's a great listener, that listens all the time and, and likes to clean the house and that loves my parents more than I do. And so he stopped, he scratches his head, and he's like, exactly how many hungry people are in the world? (laughs) I start out with a little bit of a joke this morning. But the fact is, is that we're all searching and we all want perfection in life, don't we? Don't we all want satisfaction? Isn't that what we all grasp for and we all want? Okay, whether we are a Christian or a non-believer, that's what we're all searching for in life. We're all yearning for that. We're all looking for that. Today's sermon is Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Though the world searches for satisfaction on the outside, Jesus demonstrates that righteousness goes beyond the superficial. And that's our big idea this morning. Jesus demonstrates that righteousness goes beyond the superficial. Just like Jesus always does, he's going to show the world 
that that is not the norm, that, that happiness is not on the outside. He's going to flip the script again, and we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start in what's known as the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. So if you want to find your place in your Bible this morning, you can. But before we do that, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we have together this morning in your house. Thank you once again for your word. Thank you for these red letters in our Bibles, Jesus, your words. Thank you that they're recorded and that we can study them and that we can etch them into our hearts. I ask, Father God, that we would open our hearts to these words and that we would, that we would know them as truth, but we would see them as truth and love, Lord. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Last week we established that Jesus has all authority to say what he said in Scripture. We spent the whole, the whole service establishing that, and that was very important that we did that. So if you missed it again, go back and, and watch that from last week. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he spent his time gathering his disciples before he started really moving forward in that his very first stop, he stopped at the side or at the edge of the Sea of Galilee where he met Simon Peter and Andrew, and then a little bit after that was James and John. Matthew makes sure to mention that Jesus saw them mending their nets. When he stopped along the side and saw um, Simon Peter and Andrew, they were mending their nets from the, because they were fishermen. And I can only imagine, and I think about this time when Jesus stopped to see them, they were fishermen, and it would have been a very difficult and a very hard job. Not, probably not fun, it would have been very labor-intensive, hot out there. It's not like they had commercial fishing boats. It's not like they would have had these automated nets. They were constantly mending their nets and fixing them. And it, and it said specifically that when Jesus said, let's go, that they dropped their nets. So Matthew was specific to say that, that he had to talk about their nets. And in there it said that Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men, right? We're all familiar with that. I will make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets. And so when I, when I read that and I think about that, I wonder if there was a moment in their minds that they would have thought, do I have to catch people with these nets? Like, should I take these with me or do I need to drop them? What do you mean go catch people? What does this even mean right now? Because at that moment, they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. That's that moment when they say, all right, I'm going to go and do this. Because we're all driven by something. We're all driven to have a better life, right? Right? Isn't that what we're all naturally driven to? They're probably looking at Jesus saying, whatever he's got to offer has to be better than what I'm doing right now. Whatever he has is better than mending these nasty nets. I think I'm just going to drop them and go. I'm going to find out what he's got to tell me. And so I love that passage. That's why I like reading it over and over again. And so before we actually get into the Beatitudes, I want to kind of set the stage and then we're going to get into that this morning. And so our first passage this morning is actually going to be a little bit before that. It's going to be in Matthew 4.23. It's going to be up on the screen, and you can follow along in your Bible if you want. I've got the ESV version if you're following along. It says this. It says in 4.23, And he went through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread through all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed with demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. I talked last week about how Jesus' fame gathered very quickly. I said there was about a 93-mile span that he that he was walking about from here to St. Louis. It, these, these crowds gathered in, in great numbers. So he had to go up on the sermon. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. He had to climb a mountain so that he could talk over all of these people. 
And so it's very important that Matthew uh, said this in order here. He said, it says that he was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing, okay? I said, let's say that again. He was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing. Teaching in the synagogues, he was synagogues, he was proclaiming the gospel, and then he was healing all these people. So let's think about the time back then, what was going on. Back then, we didn't have modern medicine, we didn't have doctors, we didn't have FDA-approved stuff, right? There was, there was a couple of things. If you got sick, you either got better or you died, okay? And so the fact that Jesus was healing people, sick people could go to Jesus, and they were all of a sudden better, he got famous really quick. People were like, we've got to go see this man. He's the real deal. He's not just some medicine man that's going to sprinkle whatever on and hope for the best. This is real. And so his fame grew quickly. Let's be honest in this room today. Don't we come to Jesus? Don't we come to the Lord in our low moments? Don't we? I'll be honest, I did. We don't come to the Lord. We don't come to Jesus when everything is great in life when we're doing well financially, when we're doing well in our families, when everything is great, we don't say, hey, that's when I need Jesus. That's not, that's not it. So you have to imagine this group of people, the followers, the crowds, were all people in need of Jesus. They were in need of healing, whether it was, whether it was their illness physically, whether it was demons that they needed to get rid of in their life, whether it was just sin that they were tired of holding on to. They needed healing. And they were following him. They were desperate for it. They were yearning for it. And so they were following, looking for something. Many of them didn't know what, but they knew that this man, Jesus, Yahweh, had it. So they were following him. The Beatitudes, or the portion of the Sermon on the Mount, is right at the beginning. It's the very beginning of chapter 5. Beatitudes is a rough translation for the Latin Beatus. Some Christians called the Beatitudes, let me see if I get this right, the pronunciation right. This is, this is from the Greek, um, uh, makarisms. But anyway, this is, a, this is a meaning of praise. It's a praise or a, a blessing on somebody, okay? And so what this means is it's a, it's a different, it's a, it's a, um, it's a form of of blessing and praise. And so that's why Beatitudes is, starts out with blessed are, blessed are. And so over and over again, these blessings and blessings, that's why they're called the Beatitudes. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to read through verses uh, 3 through 6, then we're going to come back through each one of the verses and kind of dissect each one of them and what they mean. So Matthew 3, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 3 through 6. Let's read through them together. In two, last week, Jesus, and, and he opened his mouth and taught them by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you notice, Jesus is talking to a group of people. He's not talking to people individually here. There's the plural here. There's not the singular. And so many people, you hear that, they'll say, blessed, I am blessed because of this, or you're blessed because of this. Jesus didn't say that. There's a group here. The group of people that are blessed are the ones that are poor in this. Okay, and that's important. We're going to come back to that a little bit later on. So just keep in mind here that this is a plural, okay? Jesus is talking to a group of people. We're going to start in verse 3 here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we first read this, it looks like blessed are those who are worn out, right? Blessed 
Blessed are those that are, that are like at the end of their rope. They can't, they can't, they're tired. The poor in spirit. That's, at least that's what, when I first read it, that's kind of what I'm thinking of. The poor in spirit. I'm tired. But let's keep this in context. Jesus is talking about and preaching about the kingdom of heaven. The vast majority of the people that were there were poor in spirit. If I'm up here and I'm preaching, I'm, I am talking to a group of people in the middle of Illinois, in central Illinois. People in this room are directly uh, related to somehow the farming industry, yes? Somehow, if you're not a farmer, then somehow what you do might have something to do with farming. If, if there is no rain for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden we have good rain. If I come in here and the first words out of my mouth are, thank you, Lord, for the rain. Did I get everybody's attention? Because it related to each and every one of you. Somehow, everybody in here is going to thank the Lord for the rain. And Jesus, the first words out of his mouth here were, blessed are the poor in spirit. Because everybody there was to see him are poor in spirit. He got their attention right away. They're like, okay, what's next? I hear you. And the next thing he says is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Why is mine the kingdom of heaven? When we use the word poor, we think that it's going without or going with less. Jesus is applying this to the ones that are, are begging for spiritual renewal. Just because we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior doesn't mean that we are without sin. The only one without sin is Jesus himself. Just because we have, we have accepted him as our Lord and personal Savior, we still battle with sin. We can be poor in spirit with sin. And he's saying, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. I've had people come to me and say, you know, since, I have, since my walk with Christ has been better, I feel like I sin more. And I'm like, no, it's because you're becoming more aware of it. It's because your, your awareness of your depravity is becoming, you are becoming more and more aware of it, and that's great. See, because when you first when you first accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you're still unaware of the sin in your life. There are little sins, not that any of them are little or big. Let me reword that. You're aware of the things in your life that are sin. And as the sanctification process happens, as you come closer and closer to the Lord, there's things in your life that you are more and more disgusted with. When you are poor in spirit, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's saying. When you become more aware of your need. You can write this down in your notes if you're following along. We find blessing when we are totally dependent upon God. When we find we are totally dependent because of our depravity. When our sin has left us totally dependent on him. We are completely bankrupt without Jesus. Let's move on to verse 4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we think of mourning, we automatically will put our minds to like, like a, a death in the family or a funeral situation that we go in mourning. We're mourning the loss of a loved one. We're mourning the loss of something so important to us. Again, let's go back to the sin in our lives. Is that though we have come to know Jesus, we still have sin. We will always have sin until the day we go home to our Heavenly Father. We'll have sin on this earth. Sin puts a barrier between us and, and God. We know that. And so what is the greatest thing in our lives that we have as Christians? What is the greatest thing we have? Grace. We have God. We have Jesus in our lives. That's the greatest thing. A relationship with God is the greatest thing that we have. And if we lose that, if that's dampened, if that's damaged, we should be in complete mourning over that. We 
you should be in complete mourning. And when you are in mourning because you understand there's that loss in there. Blessed are those who are in mourning, who are in mourning, for they shall be comforted. And that word comforted, how are we to be comforted? Who is also known as the comforter? Who is the comforter? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been called the comforter. John 14, 16. Some of the versions out there, I know the King James Version refers to him as the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. And mine in the ESV refers to the Holy Spirit as the helper, helper, comforter. Once you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul writes this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believe in him, you are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us. When we believe that Jesus died for us and accept him as our Lord and personal Savior, we have the Holy Spirit in us. You can write this down in your notes as well. Sin cannot keep us from the love of God. Once we accept Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior, it's not like, oh, I've sinned one too many times and it's done, it's over. That's not how it works. If you've been told that, that's wrong. We do not have a works-based salvation. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for us so that we can have eternity in heaven with him. The next one in verse 5, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That isn't what we're taught, though, is it? Blessed are the meek. I don't know about you, but I don't typically put that on a resume. Hi, my name's Chris Reilly. I'm meek. Oh, let's hire him. He's a quiet guy. He'll get things done around here. No, that's not a job quality. In fact, the opposite is what we're taught. We're to be strong. We're to be courageous. We're supposed to be go-getters, right? Jesus is directly quoting Psalms 37, 11. David wrote, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. First century Greco-Roman world was a status conscious place. There were classes in Roman world, in the Roman social hierarchy. There were free wealthy people that owned basically everything. There was a little bit of the middle class, but there was a lot on the bottom. There were slaves, there were people that were owned, there were people that had no say-so in anything. They were very meek people. They had no ability to own anything except their love and devotion for Jesus. That's what he's saying there, is that when you find yourself in a place to where all you can concentrate on and your ownership is your ownership for the love of Jesus Christ, that's where you'll find blessing. That's where you'll find blessing because when you are so concentrated on your ownership for everything else in this world, you'll, get, you'll lose what you can find in Jesus. The crowds that were around him were probably a lot of people that were meek. Remember, I said, when you're on top and you've got everything in the world that you could ask for, typically those aren't the people that are searching after him. It's the meek that were because they had need. When our only focus is Jesus, our blessing is limitless. Because it says that they will inherit what? The earth. That's everything. They'll inherit the earth. Let's be totally honest with ourselves this morning. Let's be totally honest, and, and we can see a show of hands on this. Who wants to have complete and utter blessing in this world? 
I, I do. Who wants to have it back to the way it was before sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden? Who would like to have that? Because if your hand is not up, then you're here for the coffee and donuts this morning. Okay? Let's face it. Whether you're a Christian or not, non-believers want that. They do. They're paying everything down to their last dime to get it. Everybody is searching for satisfaction in this world. And they'll give everything, including their souls for it. They're searching. They want it. We want it. And we have it. It's been given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus has brought the, he the kingdom of heaven down to earth to this crowd. And it's in these verses right here. And he explains how to get it. In verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And isn't satisfaction what we crave in this world? Isn't it satisfaction in every piece of our life what we really do crave in this world? We're after satisfaction in all areas of this world. That's what we want. If we turn this world upside down like Jesus did, what a different place this would be. Even within the church, think about that for a moment. If we live the way that Jesus is explaining and teaching this crowd how to live, if we live that way, how different it would be. If we became more aware just in our own brokenness as a church, if we became more aware of that, how different things would be. We would be so much quicker to forgive each other because of our awareness of our own brokenness. Everybody else here has that same brokenness. Remember, he was preaching to the crowd of people, not individuals. If we were known as the meek people in the church, not the hypocrites, remember? You, you know, people are like, I'm not going to church. It's full of hypocrites. If, if, if we were just known as, you know what? That church is just full of a bunch of sinners just like me. How many more people would be in these seats? Because it's the truth, that's what we are. If we could openly display our hunger for Jesus and openly display that that is our satisfaction. Like I said before, this crowd may not have realized it, and some of them may have, that Jesus was really just bringing the kingdom of heaven down to us. The kingdom of heaven is eternal satisfaction, and that's what we are yearning for. We, as a people, as a world, sinners, or I'm sorry, saved and unsaved, have been searching for and, and longing for the life before sin in the Garden of Eden, Eden, and that has been given to us. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is the best news that we could ever have. That is the best news. That is such a, such a simple but truthful verse that everybody should know and is so easy to give to people anywhere that you go. We all experience trials. We all experience tribulation in this world. We all experience um, what what is said here in the, in the Beatitudes here, we're all poor in spirit. We all experience that inside of this church, outside of this church. But it's all present right here. And how can we show the kingdom of heaven? How can we show the kingdom of heaven to people within our church and outside of the church? We can start by praying for each other. We can start by wrapping our arms around each other and praying for those in need, praying for the poor in spirit, praying for those that are, that are sick, that are, that are in need of healing, that are in need of, of just prayer, 
There are so many people that are, that are sitting right next to you that are in need. Some of them share it, some of them don't. They're right here. And that, church, is where we need to start. We can simply show the kingdom of heaven by that. This morning, I want to do something a little bit different. There are, there are a few people here in the church that do need some prayer. And there's some that, have, that haven't shared, uh, maybe, that, that need some prayer. And so, as we're going forward this, um, this week, that's one thing, that's my challenge to you, is I would like you to show the kingdom of heaven by praying for people in need of prayer, showing the kingdom of heaven by, by being the example here in the Beatitudes. I would like to, uh, if we could all stand up, and I want, as a church, I want us to be able to pray over some people this morning. And so if uh, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, uh, sicknesses in this church, and if they don't mind, Mike Myers, could you come up uh, forward this morning? And Judy, if you could come up this morning. And um, uh, where's Bob? Where's, where's Bob Miller? If you, if you could come up this morning. And then also, anyone else in this church, and you don't have to say why, but if there's anyone in this church that wants prayer for anything this morning, if you could come forward, and then I want the rest of this church to gather here in this center. Because this needs to be a practice in this church on a regular basis. On a regular basis, not just for special occasions. We need to be a church that prays for each other regularly. And it needs to be an example all the time because this is the kingdom of heaven on this earth here and to continue on for eternity. This needs to be what is seen here in this church and outside of these walls. We need to be a church that gathers around each other, prays for each other, prays for the community. So I'm going to lead us in prayer this morning. But again, if there's something that you want to be prayed over this morning, you don't have to say why. Just come up here in the front. But again, if we could gather gather in the center and lay hands on them, if you guys could stand here in the front. Get used to it because this is going to happen more often. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this church community. Thank you for this church family. I pray, Lord, for healing. Praise the Lord. I pray, Lord, for your, for your powerful healing. I pray, Lord, because you are the great physician. Yes, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that this church family would just continue to be united the way that they are. And I pray that you would continue to bring the kingdom of heaven down here in this place. I pray that, that we would all continue to find satisfaction in you and you alone. And I pray that this community and this town and this state would see that you are the only satisfaction and see that through us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross. Yes. We would be completely bankrupt without you. Jesus, we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes. Till later. Thank you. Church, I want to remind everybody that we need to be and continue to be a church that wraps our arms around each other and prays for each other on a regular basis. I want to be a church that comes forward and prays for each other and over each other regularly. As we leave today, well, we have one more song we're going to sing, but as we leave today, I want us to show each other, and the community that we can only find satisfaction in Jesus. 
Let's worship together.